And this quote, though, has special resonance for me. It's from the Gospel of John. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. And for those of you who have taken my Bible, Bible classes, you know that the Gospel of John was the last of the canonical Gospels written. And it was written about the year 90 or 100. So that's some 70 years, 60 to 70 years, after Jesus actually walked the earth. Right? And they talk about this Gospel as it's so different than the others. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's very, very different. In this Gospel... Jesus knows and proclaims constantly that he's divine, that he is the divine son of God. And that's why it's a special gospel for unity, folks. Because we too know, like this gospel and claim, I come to have life and have it abundantly. Think about that. Could you say this? I came here to have life and have it abundantly. Right? Now, how we interact in the world, how we go about setting that up, makes everything possible in our life. What, our basic teaching, our thoughts are creative. So if we're here to have abundant life, are you? Are we? It's a real question of where are we saying no? Where are we saying can't, not enough, too much, <sighs> tired? So absolute abundance is the course I've created because I need it. <laughs> I need the reminders on a daily and weekly and yearly basis to stay in the flow, to stop grabbing onto the log and say, there will never be another log down the hill or down the stream. There'll never be another place for me to land, to shift my consciousness. So absolute abundance is a constant flow of resources and ideas in a satisfying life. It includes but is not limited to vibrant health, fulfilling relationships, life-enhancing work, and financial freedom. In other words, money, all the financial resources, the money you need to have all those other things. And when our lives are in sync, when we are living in the principles, that's when this starts to flow. And we know we're living this life of abundance in happiness. So let's tackle the big frog first, the big hard one to swallow, money, all right? There's a quote from Marianne Williams Williamson in her book. The universe keeps a perfect set of books. What you give, you shall receive, and what you withhold shall be withheld from you. So if there's some area in your life that's in your financial life that's limited or constricted, I ask you to really look at where are you holding back financially? Where do you have the brakes on saying, no, I don't have enough. There's not enough. In fact, I invite you to pull out your bulletins right now and right on the back because I'm going to ask you three questions about money. And they're, they're serious questions. I want you to write down what comes to your mind first, not what you think I want to hear because <laughs> I won't see these. <laughs> you will. So the first question is to find out what you believe about money. What is the source of your income? What is the source of your income? Second question is, is there enough to go around for everyone? Is there enough to go around for everyone? So this is your question. Do you have enough financial resources to meet your needs? and the things you desire, and the things you desire. And can your financial situation improve? Now, these maybe seem like kindergarten questions to someone, you know, who's attending a Unity Church and knows the answers, but bear with me. Let me, let me, let me give you the, the correct answers <laughs> according to Unity teachings. 
What is the source of your income? The universe, God, the divine. Not your job, it's not your pension, it's not your social security check. The source of your income is the divine flow. All those things, who you work for, your retirement, your investments, your uh, passive income are all channels of from the one source. Is there enough to go around for all people? Yes. This is not a zero-sum game. My having something does not mean it is not available for someone else. We live in an infinite universe with infinite possibilities. But a lot of times we have guilt and shame over money because there's so many without. And there has to be a balance. In the song, Jesus sings that I just demonstrated. Jesus sings that you feel sad. Your prospects are worse. But don't worry, when you get to heaven, it'll all be fixed. Well, we know heaven here to be a state of mind, not a destination. So when we get to heaven, it's when we're understanding there's enough for everyone to go around. When we put our attention to the lifting up of others, of the people who are marginalized and don't have enough in the world, we'll see that there is bliss for everyone happiness for everyone. And if we put our attention to that, there's nothing we couldn't do. Do you have all the financial resources you need and want? Well, that's a subjective question, right? Because it's up to you to determine that. And it's up to you to allow that. We teach in unity that God is constantly flowing, right? Constantly reigning good upon us, all around us, from within us, from everything in our world. But our saying no, not enough, is what makes the difference. A couple of years ago, I was teaching a class here, an absolute abundance class. It was early on in the run, and uh, there was someone in the class who had just started coming, and we were having a discussion about finances, about money. And the question went out, can you have enough? Can you have all your needs met? And her answer was, not in this economy. <laughs> ah, okay, so can you have all your needs met? Not in this economy is an affirmation. So we went back and forth and we kept talking about that idea. And she kept saying, but no, no, the, the, the economy's too bad. Cannot get what I want. And I said, well, it's funny. I'm living in that same economy, and my needs are met. I'm living in the same economy you're talking about, and I have more than enough right now to meet my needs and to give to others. And we explored further and she found out that she was working as a consultant, as helping people with their resumes and with their coaching for getting jobs, but that when the economy soured in 2008, she decided that her friends were struggling too much and she couldn't charge them for her services anymore. So for her, not in that economy was a real valid statement because she had decided that there wasn't enough and she wasn't valuable enough to charge for her services. And over and over again, I am amazed at what comes out of my mouth, right? Like, oh, we can't afford that. Oh, there's not enough time. Those are also limiting affirmations. That it's like, I'm choosing to put my resources here is a better way than saying that there's not enough money, right? Because, let's be honest, we can choose to buy anything we want if we want to give up food and shelter and clothing. <laughs> so I am choosing <laughs> to buy <laughs> this instead of this is a wise and empowering choice. But that constant, I can't, I can't, there's not enough, will make us feel trapped not in this economy, not right now, maybe one day, is a way of blowing that up, is to look at it, to look at your core beliefs and to consciously shift them. 
How many times do you hear from people, even here, I live on a fixed income? I live on a fixed income. Oh, s something resonated over here. I heard a mmm, right? <laughs> My father lives on a fixed income too. He lives in his 5,000 square foot home on a golf course in a gated village in, in Georgia on a fixed income, <laughs> right? And it's like, what's your perception of fixed income? What's possible in the world? And is there no way on earth that some unexpected good can come to you? I expect unexpected income. Do you? <laughs> I expect windfalls. Do you? That's how we shift our financial well-being to something that can create in the world. And God is the source of all of your good. The universe is the source, not your employer, not your government, not your pension plan. Because that all can shift and will shift. The source never goes away. We make choices every day to align ourselves and to keep expanding. So another one that we get caught up on is vibrant health. Right? Health, because it's what we need to be in the world, to feel empowered. And when something goes wrong in our health, sometimes everything else piles up. But Louise Hay said years ago, love is the great miracle cure. Loving ourselves works miracles in our lives. And if you know the Myrtle Fillmore story, Myrtle is our co-founder, and she was diagnosed with um, tuberculosis. Thank you. I was about to say leukemia. I knew that was not right. <laughs> it was tuberculosis. And uh, she, after years of struggling with tuberculosis, started apologizing to her body apologizing to her body for ever calling it weak or diseased and started loving every part of her body, saying to it, I love you, you're beautiful. Thank you to her arms, to her lungs, to her body, to her strength, and watched as she lifted up. I know I have applied that in my life, and I need to apply it further. But can we look at the mirror right now and look at our bodies and say, I love you. We say every Sunday to our children, right? You are God's perfect child. We love you exactly the way you are. Can you look in the mirror today at your body or look down at your body right now and say, hello, body. <laughs> I love you exactly the way you are. I love you exactly the way you are. You are perfect and whole and complete exactly as we are. When I stand in a yoga class and I'm looking in the mirror, I do hot yoga, or I used to before I had kids, and I'd stand there and look in the mirror and I, I would see my body and I'd be doing the yoga exercises and doing my affirmations, but being so violently unhappy with my body in my head. And it's like going, how is that ever gonna work? Right? How is that? It's like, if anyone spoke to me that way, I would kick them out of my house. I would t say, how dare you? But I say it to myself. <sighs> so when we hear ourselves limiting or condemning or blaming our body, there's an opportunity to shift, an opportunity to extend love. Love is your great miracle cure even to the disease, even to the disease. As I shared publicly with you, I'm HIV positive. That was the greatest gift of my life. It got me off my ass. <laughs> it got me up and got me doing things. Within a year of receiving my diagnosis as HIV positive, I was working on a national tour heading to Broadway because time was not to be wasted. 30 years later, I stand before you talking about the gifts of loving every part, the loving the disease, loving your body, loving the experience. There is nothing better than love to cure. Life-enhancing work. You know, 
we sometimes think that when I get the right job, it'll be different. I've heard in these same classes, but you don't understand, my work, my job is a toxic mess. Being there is just soul draining, soul draining. It, like, it wears me down on a daily basis. And I empathize, I get that. But as miracle workers, as truth students, as light beings, right? I am what? Uh, I am depressed, is what you're saying? No, <laughs> no. I am light. I am not the things my family did. I am not the voices in my head. I am light. So don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. By the great, great inspirer of MLK, Howard Thurman. We all build on each other's wisdom, on each other's knowledge. Howard Thurman influenced Martin Luther King, who was also influenced, of course, by Gandhi and his teachings. And I have had the privilege, and we've all had the privilege of coming through many, many great spiritual teachers. So in the midst of the toxic work environment, what do you become? Positivity. In the midst of the toxic work environment, what do you share? Love. In the midst of the toxic work environment, what do you look for? The exit door, <laughs> right? But to do, not under, do not be deceived that you're making the choice to stay or making the choice to leave. Those are all your choices. And how you are in the environment shifts the environment, right? If you're different, the environment has to be. If I can say to the voice in my side, my head now, you won't speak to me that way, we can say that even in work environments. You won't speak to me that way. I won't put up with it, period. When we do, when we do find that, we shift the equation totally for ourselves. And the last that I talked about you today is fulfilling relationships. You know, often we're, we are constantly in our lives trying to replicate and heal our primary relationships, right? which means our relationship with our parents. It's so easy to see in other people. <laughs> Aren't they a gift, <laughs> right? That we keep having the same relationship over and over again in an attempt to heal what we think we didn't get from our parents. And uh, I know that feeling. I know that dance. But I ask you, once you've identified what it is you feel you didn't get from your parents, that you needed, that has left you less than feeling whole, I ask you, are your parents the only people you can get it from? No, no. We can choose to get our needs met in an infinite number of ways. And while I felt certain things in my life and in my growing up, as a parent now, I sit there and go, oh my God, how can I ever, ever give this child everything it needs, even though I want to? Even though I want to. And with an adopted son who came to us later in life, I didn't make all the choices that have led to this moment. But I am responsible for the choices from here forward. What I can give and what I say no to. So I also tell him, get what you need. I really want you to have it. So in our relationships, in our romantic relationships, in our friendships, in our work relationships, being able and wise enough to separate out what's about my parents <laughs> and what's about this situation, what's about my wholeness, 
when we operate from wholeness, when we understand that we are in charge of getting what we need, it lets the other person off the hook. Our spouse is not responsible for fixing our childhood. We are. My boss is not responsible for making me feel good about who I am. I am. My friends are not there just to support me. I'm there to support them. I'm there to give to them from my wholeness, from my deep, deep reservoirs. It all comes down to this quote. Far too many people are looking for the right person instead of trying to be the right person. <laughs> And in my wedding ceremonies, there's a couple here that I married. No, I say happiness in a marriage isn't about finding the right partner. It's about being the right partner. Right? Happiness in any relationship is about being the right partner, about being the one you've been called here to be. Right? Whole, complete, loving. Absolute abundance is about living in this, quote, grant that I may not seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. Now, this is written not as an affirmative prayer. <laughs> it's an ask. It's a request of God. But the truth of it is nevertheless incredibly powerful. If we took out the word grant and said, I know that I am not seeking to be consoled, but I am here to console. I know that I am not seeking to understand, but I'm here, or to be understood, but I'm here to understand others. I am here to give love. Then all the rest just happens. All the rest just takes place. Unity San Francisco is 100 years old this year. We are sitting at the precipice of, do we want to grow up? <laughs> right? Do, wanna we, do we want to be taken seriously? Do we want to actually live out our vision statement we talked about earlier? That we're a vibrant spiritual community honoring the divine presence in all? Well, honoring the divine presence in all is meaning being the one bringing love to the situation. Bringing positivity to the toxic workplace, right? Bringing hope and health and wholeness to the disease. Knowing that this disease has been a gift and I thank you for it. Now let's find out what's next in my life. Right? Right? I know I'm looking at all the faces here and I know the people that are sitting at home. There's not a single soul here that hasn't been through something, right? I haven't done this in a while. Raise your hand if you've been through a dark night of the soul. <laughs> now, keep it up, keep it up. Raise your other hand if you got through it. Now look around. <laughs> look around. <laughs> this is called testifying. <laughs> right? <laughs> we are here, we are here to be the demonstration, to be the love in the face of the lack, to be the abundance in the ones who say, I can't, there's not enough, I'm scared. Well, release the fear. Who the hell isn't scared? Courage is action in the face of fear. Amen? Right. Amen. Courage is action in the face of fear. So look at the lack in the eye and say, this is an infinite universe. So this is not obviously the right channel to be looking for my good. Next. Next. When you're in the workplace, that's toxic. Next. There is more than enough work. Oh, but the fear, my pension, my this, my that, I hear it, I hear it, I hear it. I hear it in my own head. I hear it in yours. I hear it when people come to me. As we breathe through the fear, we can create anything we want. This symbol that we had created this year is very purposeful. That growing, expanding person is representative of each and every one of us, showering our rainbow blessings on the world. We are light. We are beautiful, abundant possibility, and we don't have to play small. 
So who are you going to be in the next section of your life? The best you can be, and the best is coming right now. Amen. 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 Right? The best is yet to be. When we can step into that and let go of the buts and the yets and the ands and go, let's see what the universe has in store. I'm ready. I'm here. I'm willing. The world shifts. Let's take that to our time of meditation.